Okay, today we have two poems, uh, one by Carolyn Forche, The Colonel, and another one by Percy Bysshe Shelley, Ozymandias. Let's start with The Colonel, and this is based on an event that really happened to Carolyn Forche when she was in Central America working on human rights. Uh, she really did meet a colonel who emptied a bag of human ears in front of her. The Colonel, what you have heard is true. I was in his house. His wife carried a tray of coffee and sugar. His daughter filed her nails. His son went out for the night. There were daily papers, pet dogs, a pistol on the cushion beside him. The moon swung bare on its black cord over the house. On the television was a cop show. It was in English. Broken bottles were embedded in the walls around the house to scoop the kneecaps from a man's legs or cut his hands to lace. On the windows there were some there were gratings like those in liquor stores. We had dinner. Rack of lamb, good wine. A gold bell was on the table for calling the maid. The maid brought green mangoes, salt, a type of bread. I was asked how he enjoyed the country. There was a brief commercial in Spanish. His wife took everything away. There was some talk of how difficult it had become to govern. The parrot said hello on the terrace. The colonel told it to shut up and pushed himself from the table. My friend said to me with his eyes, say nothing. The colonel returned with a sack used to bring groceries home. He spilled many human ears on the table. They were like dried peach halves. There was no other way to say this. He took one of them in his hands, shook it in our faces, dropped it into a water glass. It came alive there. I'm tired of fooling around, he said. And as for the rights of anyone, tell your people they can go fuck themselves. He swept the ears to the floor with his arm and held the last of his wine in the air. Something for your poetry, no? he said. Some of the ears on the floor caught the scrap of his voice. Some of the ears on the floor were pressed to the ground. So this poem is shaped unlike poems we're used to because we don't see the typical line breaks. And a poem like this, it's called a prose poem. If we were to use a line break, let's just say we pushed enter every time we got to the end of a sentence, it would look more like a poem, but that doesn't change the fact that it's, it's poetry, it's poetic language. It's doing the same sorts of thing that we are used to poetry doing uh, when it's sort of more traditional uh, line breakage, okay? Uh, but let's walk through this together. What you have heard is true. So the first line of a poem like that, what you've heard is true. Uh, if I said that to you, what you've heard is true, or did you hear it's true? You, sh you prepare yourself for a surprise, right? Something shocking. I was in his house, and you're thinking, oh, what's, what, what happened? His wife carried a tray of coffee and sugar. Well, you know it can't be that, right? Uh, that's not what you've heard is true. Um, something's coming. His daughter filed her nails. His son went out for the night. There were daily papers, pet dogs, a pistol on the cushion beside it. Okay, now you can stop and say, okay, well, that may not be hugely unusual, but that's not what goes on in my house, for example. Um, and so we're waiting for, as we start this poem, we're waiting for, well, what is the shocking information? And she presents, first of all, these ordinary things, his wife carrying in coffee, his daughter filing her nails, the son going out for the night, there's daily papers, there's a pet dog. Okay, and we're waiting for that thing. And finally, the, the pistol on the cushion beside him is just kind of thrown in with all these other ordinary things. Okay, so think about that, just sort of the way that uh, Forche intermixes sort of the ordinary with the extraordinary. The moon swung bare on its black cord over the house. Probably the most poetic sounding line in the entire poem. That sounds like poetry. On the television was a cop show. It was in English. Okay, so they're watching likely American TV, right? And we know in real life this happened in Central America. And I think it's, we could say, okay, well, this particular poem is also set somewhere in Central America. Okay. So there's a t the TV's on, there's a cop show. Broken bottles were embedded in the walls around the, sh the house to scoop out the kneecaps. So you can imagine what a broken bottle is, is into the walls and so you can't climb the walls or uh, it would break up your hands and knees, right? Okay, well, that's unusual. On the windows, there were gratings like those in liquor stores. Okay, so that's unusual. So this mixture of usual, everyday, this is the way things are, and then a gun on a seat cushion nearby liquor store gratings on uh, the windows, these bottles embedded in the walls. Uh, back to normal, we had dinner, rack of lamb, good wine, a gold bell was on the table for calling the maid. So the colonel's living pretty well, right? 
the main brought green mangoes, salt type of uh, bread, and then the conversation starts. I was asked how I enjoyed the country, and there was brief commercial in Spanish. His, we don't know how she answers the question. His wife took everything away. There was some talk then of how difficult it had become to govern. So you can imagine the colonel as some sort of a, a leader. That's what a, a colonel is, like some sort of a military leader, perhaps some sort of a dictator. Okay. And it's becoming difficult to govern, uh, which means I guess the people are getting unruly, uh, dissatisfied. The parrot said hello on the terrace. The, the colonel told it to shut up and push himself from the table. So clearly it wasn't the parrot. Maybe that was just sort of the, you know, the, the last straw. The colonel is very annoyed. My friend said to me with his eyes, say nothing. Okay, so you know that kind of moment when uh, somebody's looking at you and kind of giving you wide eyes as if to say, don't say anything. Obviously, they're kind of in a, a very strange, maybe even dangerous sort of position here. Uh, he returned with a sack used to bring groceries home, an ordinary grocery sack, right? Uh, a brown paper bag, the very ordinary. He spilled many human ears on the table. Now, maybe when you first read that, you're thinking, oh, I wonder what that means. That must be a metaphor for something, because okay, it can't really be human ears. Uh, and it is, I would say, uh, a metaphor, and I invite you to think of ways that is a metaphor, but it also is literal. In this poem, there are literal human ears that he ha keeps in a uh, grocery bag. You might wonder why he does that. Um, it, they could be trophies. They could be a form of terror. My sense is the people who used to own those ears aren't alive anymore. But this might be just either trophies or a way of keeping track. Or if you leave a, a body behind, if you cut off its ears, maybe, you know, that's meant to send some sort of a message. And they look like dried peach halves. There's no other way to say this. So he takes one of them, shook it on our faces, takes one of these ears and shakes it in your face. So you have this human body part, shakes it in your faces, drops it, and it came alive there. Okay, so you can imagine, I guess it's pretty dried or desiccated. And as it's floating or sinking in the glass of water, it's kind of coming more alive. And so he says, I'm tired of fooling around. And so for him, fooling around is to put up with, I suppose, any disagreement. And then as for the rights of anyone, tell your people they can go fuck themselves. Okay, so as for the rights of anyone, uh, I don't have the luxury of providing people rights. And so your people who send you here or who you're trying to collect information for, or she was right working for some human rights groups of Central American human rights groups, he doesn't care what they say. Okay, he swept the ears to the floor with his arm and held up the wine in the air as if some sort of celebration. Something for your poetry, no, he said. Uh, something for your poetry, yes. Uh, obviously, this is something for your poetry. We have a poem from this, don't we? In fact, it's her most famous poem. Some of the ears on the floor caught this scrap of his voice. Some of the ears on the ground, some of the ears on the floor were pressed to the ground. There's an old expression, keep your ear pressed to the ground or keep your ear to the ground. And I'm not exactly sure where it comes from. I've heard it's, you know, back in Western days, you put your ear to the ground to hear if there's a uh, stampede coming or something like that. But whatever it is, you, if somebody says, hey, keep your ear to the ground or keep your ear pressed to the ground, what it means is something's coming. And what that something coming, here are the ears of presumably corpses dead because uh, of him who know that something's coming. We could ask ourselves, what kind of life is the colonel actually living? He seems to be living pretty well. He's got a maid. He's got good food, good wine. But look how he lives. He has a pistol on his cushion. He's got liquor store grating on his windows. He's got glass embedded in his walls. He lives in fear. He's a person who lives terrified. And that's why his reaction when he says, I'm tired of fooling around, that reaction of his uh, suggests his fear, his frustration. He is a person who rules by terror. That's why he has a bag of human ears. That's why he's interested in taking human ears off of people. He lives by fear. He lives by terrorizing his people. And it seems as if it's getting difficult to govern. The people maybe aren't putting up with it as easily as he's hoping they would. And so he he's becoming more drastic. So I think the message is, it's one message might be, that those who rule by fear must live in fear. And I would add, rightly so. And I'd say the colonel has plenty to fear. Uh, it is getting unruly to govern. People cannot live forever 
under subjugation. They can't be oppressed forever. And those ears that are pressed to the ground, those ears are listening. They're listening for what's coming. And I think uh, rougher times are coming for the colonel. The colonel cannot continue ruling the way he does. And speaking of cruel leaders, let's take a look at Ozymandias by Percy Bysshe Shelley. Percy Shelley, you can see, wrote quite a long time ago. He's an English poet uh, of the Romantic era. And he and a few others, uh, Lord Byron and uh, John Keyes, these were the big, big names at that time, William Wordsworth. Uh, and they were treated as rock stars in their time. And he and his wife were with... Uh, hanging out with Lord Byron and a few other people at a castle. And they each said, well, let's, uh, let's tell a story. Each one of us will tell a story. And uh, Percy Shelley's wife uh, told a story of a dream she had. And they said, wow, that's really good. You should turn it into a, a book, a novel. And she did. And today she's much more famous than her husband, Percy Bysshe Shelley. Uh, her name is Mary Shelley, and she wrote Frankenstein. So uh, <laughs> as great as he was, she's remembered much more hundreds of years later. Anyway, Ozymandias. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculpture well those passions read, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things the hand that mocked them, the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. Well, if you were to count the number of lines here, you would find out that it's 14. And 14 lines is the traditional length of a sonnet. Shakespeare wrote uh, over 150 sonnets, and all of them are 14 lines long. And there are sonnets, there are Italian sonnets, Petrarchian sonnets that go back into the Italian Renaissance. So by the time uh, Percy Shelley was writing sonnets, a uh, sonnet was an old established form. And each one, uh, they, there's different rhyme schemes for, is it an English sonnet, is it an Italian sonnet? If you're interested in that, you can, you can look that up. But it's just kind of interesting. He's using this old-fashioned, uh, even for him, uh, sonnet form for this particular poem. And he, many of his poems are uh, sonnets. So let's just take it piece by piece. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, and then everything that follows in this poem is what the traveler from the antique land says. The traveler says, well, there's these two giant stone legs, part of a statue. They stand in a desert. And near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies. A visage is a, is a face whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read. So if you were to look at this face, this frowning, wrinkled sneer, this like contemptuous face of cold command, tell that its sculptor well those passions read, you and I would say, tell that those passions were real, well read by the sculptor. In other words, the sculptor was looking at the face, looking back at him and said, okay, I get it. I am reading what you want on your statue. Or I'm reading that face. The real life Ozymandias' face is repeated onto the, the shattered uh, sculpture version of him, which yet survives stamped on these lifeless things. So those passions uh, that sneer, the wrinkled lip, they still survive stamped on these lifeless things, the stone. The hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. To mock something means to imitate it, okay? It doesn't necessarily mean to make fun of something. If you, if you say to somebody, are you mocking me? It means you're kind of making fun of me. But to mock something also means to make an imitation of something. If you were to design a building, somebody might want a mock-up, meaning I want to see what a model of that building uh, would look like. Okay, so the hand that mocked them, that would be the sculptor's hand, right? Uh, and the heart that fed, that would be Ozymandias himself. So these passions yet survive that the sculptor was reading off of the face of the live Ozymandias live on. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. 
Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing besides remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. And so that's it. Two trunks of stone, a half-shattered uh, face, and a pedestal. All that remains of the great Ozymandias, King of Kings. Now, on the pedestal, these words really are, uh, in some ways, truly are mocking in a, in a uh, negative sort of sense, Ozymandias. Because I'm sure Ozymandias wanted us to look at the statue, look on my works, ye mighty and despair, and you look around and there's nothing. So what happened to his great works? What, he, what sort of leader was he? He's similar to the colonel, right? That he seemed to rule by fear and frown and, and, and con contempt of the people, his sneer of cold command. And maybe he built great, great works to his own honor, to his self-aggrandizement, and nothing remains. So his words, look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Presumably he means, hey, take a look. You think you're good? Look at what I did. All right. And despair. You will never be able to achieve what I've achieved. Look around you. And you look around you, there's nothing there. So we do have a reason to despair. But it's not the reason he would have us despair. The reason to despair is that nothing we do lasts forever. Eventually, everything we touch turns to dust. So maybe you and I even have a reason to despair because, my God, the great Ozymandias, who, <laughs> except for this poem, nobody's really much heard of, uh, the great Ozymandias, uh, even he, a great king, whatever he touched is now more or less turned to dust, except for what the sculpture uh, uh, reveals about him. However, maybe uh, Shelley is not addressing this poem to you and me. It says, look on my works, ye mighty and despair. Well, I'm not very mighty. Maybe you don't think you, of yourself as very mighty. Maybe this poem is directed not at you and me, but at people who would set themselves up as the mighty. Okay, and Ozymandias is saying to them, look on my works, ye mighty. You think you're great? You think you're a great king? Look at what I've accomplished. So maybe those are the people who look around and see nothing but sand, uh, have more reason to despair than you and I would, because I think maybe the bottom line with Ozymandias is misspent energy. You know, here he is, king of kings, and what sort of life did he live with his frown and his sneer of cold command and his wrinkled lips? What kind of life was that? And what did he achieve in his life? Ultimately, whatever he achieved is turned to dust now. But there are names you and I know from the ancient past. We've heard of Sophocles, for example and Socrates, and Aristotle, and great people from the past whose names live on. But not so much Ozymandias's, because maybe those other people whose names live on, at least the ones who we remember fondly, spent their energies better than Ozymandias did, who spent his energies building up himself. And in the end, there's nothing left. Okay, guys, that's it. Take care. Bye now.